Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Professor, thank you for sparing time to come down. Thank you for having me. I, I see you're a, not only a Trump fan but a Jim Elder fan too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've equipped half our house with paintings that we bought at Elder Auctions. Yeah, we I... get their catalogues and um, we don't have too much wall space left now but <laughs> we, we don't sell them. Well, we, no. we, we buy paintings because we like them. Yeah. The, other, the rest of the other paintings we've got are, are Broken Hill paintings and oh, yeah. Pro Hart was a good friend of mine. We... Yeah. Um, uh, well, were both patrons of Lifeline. I still am, yeah. and so we used to have Lifeline auctions. And as a patron, I'd have to bid for a Pro Hart painting. So I'd put my hand up to, to bid, and, and he bloody will bid against me. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally, I left yeah. him with it. <laughs> yes. Well, if you so, know you're not going to get something, sometimes it's fun to drive the price well, up and make I, the bugger pay. That's exactly what I did. I had another situation where I had a a couple of grandparents who were bidding for a footy signed by mm. every player in the Adelaide Crows and I didn't want it but I wanted to raise money for Lifeline so I bid against them and eventually they backed out and then I asked for a, a, a pause and had a quiet word and said, look, I'll, I'll go, go your halves um, but mm. I'll put in a decent bid. So I bid again above myself. Lifeline made some money. They got the footy for less than they'd bid, mm. and um, Lifeline did well. So oh, bless that's you. how I I've acquired a... a lot of my Broken Hill paintings by <laughs> Lifeline Art Auctions yeah. and the the other paintings we've got from Elder Fine Art in uh, yeah. North Adelaide. Well, so you get, uh, you get a, uh, a really good feeling because you're helping a very worthwhile charity. Uh, you're getting an investment that you can look at, and it doesn't, uh, my understanding is, you, not that I sell anything, but... Uh, there's no capital gains tax on paintings or art or old cars. And that's an advantage. And you get to enjoy the thing that you've invested in. Well, it does cost you money. I've had to set up lighting for some of my favourite paintings so I can have lights on them. Yes, oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's a one great of my favourites is a French painting of the early 1800s. Um, we know nothing about the artist, but it's absolutely exquisite. Yes. I don't know what it's worth. Yeah. But it's worth a lot for my piece and, yes, yes. and goodwill right. just to have this to look at. Yeah. And so we, we have the whole house full of paintings. Well, what's the point of looking at a wall when you can cover the wall with things that you like looking at? Yes. And that when you change sense. a painting, you realise it's a different size and you've got to repaint the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and it's inevitably a, a mark underneath. So That's exactly right. <laughs> so just leave everything the way you like it, yes. precisely where it yes. is. And, and it starts to look like an old people's home. Oh, no, I think that's a wonderful look. Oh, I do too. I, these, some of these modern houses, they're, they're just, everything's square. Minimalist. Uh, minimalist. And grey. Uh, well, I think they're ugly. No, they paint them black, which I think is a, a oh. window into their soul. <laughs> a black kitchen, black exterior. <laughs> and these square white walls, the, the house is dominated by a media room. Mm. Well, the house is dominated by libraries and paintings. Yes. We, we just have a different sort of person. Yeah. So we've been down to Elder Fine Art. We get their catalogues. We absolutely love it. Yes, I think it's an adventure because every every sale is different. Every sale is filled with things that not everything tempts you, but a lot do. Well, we go down there with a the budget, and uh, it's always exceeded. Well, you've got discipline. A double or triple. But <laughs> no, it's not discipline. No, it's what we like, and yeah, we don't have to mortgage the house to buy the next painting. So no, no, we no. do it, and uh, our budgets are. Yeah, they're only for guidance. Just look at what the federal government does. Yes, oh, just for God. guidance. <laughs> <laughs> guidance. <laughs> uh, you know, last uh, Friday, I think it was, I was um, telling people about this um, Flinders University study that revealed we were in mortal danger because of killer viruses that were lurking in the permafrost. And as the permafrost, uh, in this bloke's opinion, was melting, these viruses would be turned loose on an unsuspecting dear, population. Dear, I'm frightened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, look, the, the, the person I would go to, why didn't the ABC go to Professor Plymer and say, is this true? Or maybe even ask this bloke from Flinders a few pertinent questions like how he knew and what was the evidence and who discovered 
Nothing, no. Straight through to the keeper. Just Well, we're, we're in mortal danger. There's no two ways about that. It's from gross stupidity. Yes, yes. And um, I haven't appeared on the ABC for probably 20 years, nor have I listened to them for 20 years. Yeah. I'm a great lover of classical music, but I web stream Radio Swiss Classic. I cannot stand the ABC telling me what a wonderful piece of music that was when it wasn't and it was badly performed. <laughs> uh, I think they're an organ- organisation that should be subscription yeah. and um, maybe ABC regionals are a different matter, but the ABC don't ask the right questions and the questions I would have asked is, well, fine, tell me about the past meltings of the permafrost. Tell me about the history of viruses over the history of the planet. And we've had viruses for thousands of millions of years on planet Earth. We don't really understand them very well. They're not life and yet they behave like life. But we've had the permafrost melt many, many times. How many times? Oh, it would be thousands of times. Countless. Um, We go through cycles of climate and these cycles are driven by uh, the sun, they're driven by the orbit of the Earth, they're driven by where the continents are and what the continents are doing or what the ocean floor is doing. So we have these cycles which we've measured going right back in the past of climate change. Yes. And we've had ice on the planet for less than 20% of time. So that means that the ice has come and gone. That means that we've we've had melting. And if we've had melting, these viruses should have been active before. They haven't been. Now, they've been... um, Those viruses have been in the tundra for a very long period of time. They disappear and they come back again. We have had melting of the tundra when humans have been on Earth. So we have no evidence from the past. I can't see why all of a sudden the very, very slight temperature change which we've had, which is within variability, which is not a worry, um, we're certainly in no temperature or climate catastrophe, I can't see why that should be a worry. Now, of course, if the temperature changes by half a degree Celsius, life is going to change, and we know that from floating organisms on the surface of the oceans. They are a very good guide to temperature to plus or minus 0.1 degree Celsius. And they change in their chemistry. They also change species depending upon temperature. So we've monitored these from deep ocean core drilling and we can, we can plot the change of floating species against other temperature proxies so we can see that life responds to temperature. But every time we've had an increase in temperature, we've had an increase in life, an increase in diversity, a thriving of communities. Mm-hmm. It is the cold that kills. It's Jack Frost that kills. So uh, I think uh, this person was probably suffering from a little bit of attention deficit disorder, wanted a bit of attention and had to say something. Uh, it, we're still in the silly season, the tale of the silly season. <laughs> the ABC is the perfect organisation to air one of these ideas as long as it fits with their uh, general view of the yeah. world. Yes, their, their, their narrative, which is uh, catastrophizing always this business of climate. Uh, and, and, that, and you get a situation, uh, must have been before Christmas, slightly before Christmas, where we were warned that we were going to have uh, the hottest, driest, most desert-like summer uh, in memory, bushfires, uh, disaster, disaster. And I, I don't know, We've had here we've had one day with the temperature over 40 degrees. It's been a cool, very pleasant, mild summer. Yes, cool. They got it wrong. Yes. They got it they wrong. They got it very wrong. And if they can't get it wrong over a couple of months in advance, then what about 50 or 100 years' time? Yeah. But uh, what they don't consider is the other driving forces of climate. They look at their climate models, the same models which uh, have been shown to be wrong for long-term climate. They look at these models and I think the weather forecasts are pretty good a couple of days away um, they, they can tell us what's going to happen next Monday and I think they're generally pretty right. Mm. But what's going to happen in three months' time, three years' time, 30 years' time? Uh, no. And there are the wild cards that don't even consider. We've had massive changes in the El Nino, uh, La Nina southern oscillation. And much of that is driven by volcanic activity on the seafloor. Mm. Mm. Uh, much of that has been driven by this Tonga eruption where we filled the upper atmosphere and the stratosphere with water vapour, 10% of the water vapour in the stratosphere has come from that one eruption. That is why we have regular rain bombs when this um, 
does a lap of the planet and then we get heavy rain. We know that in the past, if we look at Brisbane's floods and Brisbane's heavy rains, mm. we can mm. see that that's tied into volcanic eruptions in the past, normally in Chile. So the the, the bomb, who we pay a million dollars a day for... Really? A million dollars a day, the bomb are getting it wrong and they're not looking at all the factors. They're not looking at the astronomical factors. Have they been politicised? Are they just simply going along with this uh, mass hysteria? A state-funded organisation is totally politicised. We're now in the position where we cannot get independent advice and what we have now are a number of private groups setting up Mm. meteorological organisations. So we have the Inigo Jones um, followers and um, David, I've forgotten his surname, I think it's Burton, um, Mm. is running that and he is working with farmers and predicting what the weather's going to be like next summer Mm. And whether you should um, leave the fields in fallow or put in canola or and maybe increase your stock. Yeah. And he is incredibly successful and he's looking at planetary alignments, the behaviour of the sun, uh, the behaviour of the oceans, the behaviour of, uh, of volcanicity. And people are now turning to people yeah. like him. I remember years ago we used to talk to, uh, not Inigo because he'd long gone, but was it Lennox Walker? Yes, Lennox Walker, yes. Yeah, yes. I don't know, is he still alive? I don't know. <coughs> I don't know either, but he was always very yeah. entertaining yeah. and very, very And also very good. accurate. So yeah. people are now ignoring the bomb, still paying a million dollars a day and saying, well, look, I, I want to know whether to destock or, or whether to, yes. to increase my stock. Um, I can't get any sense out of the bomb. They failed me in the past. I'm going somewhere else. And they do. Now, this is very important um, on the futures market. And I know when I was talking to David, I saw him in uh, Seymour just before Christmas, Seymour in Victoria, and he had bought um, options for wheat um, for some a year in advance. Yes. And these options, of course, are a dangerous thing to do. If, if, if you get it wrong, you've got to cough up. But he in the past had made a lot of money out of buying um, options on, say, 50 tonnes or 500 tonnes of wheat. Mm. And so he's putting his money where his mouth is. Yeah. The yeah. bomb don't. The bomb get it wrong, they still get funded. Yeah, they still get uh, well. That's just, uh, it's like a doctor who buries his mistakes. You, d- 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 no one seems to make too much mention of it when they get it wrong. Well, some people do. There's a website by Jennifer Marahassi where she has looked at some of the measurement stations that the bombs had for a long period of time, and the one that comes to mind is at Rutherglen in northern Victoria. Now, Rutherglen's site has been there for a hundred years. It's not been moved. The equipment hasn't been changed. There's been no encroachment of suburbia or airports around it. And the Rutherglen data is showing that we have been in uh, a long period of cooling over 100 years. So what's the bomb done? It's got to the old data, changed it, um, made it cooler and made it look as if we've got a period of warming. Now, (laughs) she's got data from Rutherglen, from Burke, from Darwin, which is a bit of an exception because the Darwin station was bombed and had to be moved to the airport. But she's got a lot of data showing that the bomb actually changed the primary measurements. This also happens in the US, this happens in Europe, this happens in many parts of the world, and this is the global group of people who are warming us. Now, I take real exception to that in this country because in this country we've had people on outback stations measuring temperature, humidity, wind, um, air pressure. Every three hours they've been doing it every day. They've got handwritten records. Those are accurate records. Yes, they might not be accurate to a hundredth of a degree Celsius, but they're accurate to a tenth of a degree Celsius. And a station has got those records going over 120 years and the bomb has just thrown them out. And I think that's um, a terrible tragedy. I think it's a disrespect for those people who offered their services and have helped. We've had post offices, outback post offices, where we haven't had motor vehicles, where we haven't had jet engines blasting hot air, where we haven't had air conditioners, where we haven't had a city. And that post office has got measurements for Mm. over 100 years. Mm. They've Mm. been ignored Mm. by the bomb. Mm. What they do is the bomb has now created its own measuring equipment, which is not standard equipment. It's not equipment used around the world. They've got their own electronic equipment. They have then um, used this to create a temperature record which are then modelled and changed. And from that, they pass this data on to the IPCC, they pass it on to the government, and that's the data that's used. So we start with a data set that's changed anyway. 
don't know what do they get it wrong. So the Bureau of Meteorology has got a uh, an agenda. Clearly, you wouldn't be changing things if you didn't have an agenda. Because well, I think the agenda is a very simple one. Uh, it's that uh, they are catastrophists and they want to maintain employment. Yeah. We, we have a very large number of people in these institutions and I've spent more than 30 years as a, a chair in universities around the world. A very large number of people in universities are unemployable and eminently unemployable, so much so that they get paid by your money to pursue their ho- hobby, which they call research. The taxpayer pays them. Yeah. Uh, they're... Generally, pretty poor teachers. So anyone that's been to university, you can you can count on a sawmiller's hand the number of people who are <laughs> inspirational <laughs> teachers, and everyone will tell you that. Oh yes, I remember so and so and so. They were yeah, great teachers, right. but yep, all yep. the rest, no. So we've been very very badly let down by our independent institutions, um, who are are about scholarship mm. and the search for knowledge. These institutions are not about wokeness. They're not about telling us how to think. So we now have a situation where um, we have a large number of unemployable people in the bureaucracy, in the universities, in all the other institutions, and we're paying them. Yes, yes. And as a result, we pay for the the bad policies that arise from their, from their yeah. opinions. And they don't get questioned. There was a, a story, um, oh, about the uh, hottest year we've ever had last year. It, it, was, it broke all the records or something. And then when I read down into the story, it said since the hottest day since the Industrial Revolution, and it mentioned some dates, when you Google the Industrial Revolution, the dates that they provided were all wrong, totally wrong. And then uh, since records were kept... Now, I didn't know by that whether you you would have a a record-keeping service in... Uh, you know, a thousand, two thousand different places around the world to get the mean average, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But apparently, uh, the, the first record that was kept continuously was done in a little English town in about 1860, 1865, something like that. And that was just a record, the only record it was of what was happening in that little town. Nowhere else in the world. But they want to sort of pretend that records have been kept since the 1700s and they can compare and look back. And nobody says, would you, would you explain or would you prove to me that what you're saying is statistically and uh, uh, evidence-based? Nothing. Well, Jeremy, you've raised a lot of problems here. The first thing is we have got a, a record from central England, which goes back hundreds of years, Uh, The second thing is that we have had very, very few stations measuring temperature and pressure and and all the other parameters uh, up until very recently. And then since the um, breakdown of the Soviet Union, we have lost a lot of the um, polar record-keeping stations. And thirdly, it is absolute nonsense to try to get an average temperature of planet Earth because we don't have an even distribution. Uh-huh. Where would of you do it? The stations. deserts, the mountains. Well, the... if you if you measure, say, at uh, Jeddah uh, on the Red Sea, and then average that with the temperature from um, Vostok in Antarctica, yeah. you will get a number that's meaningless. And we have more measuring stations in the US and in Europe than we do elsewhere in the world. We have very few measuring stations over the ocean. The only accurate measuring stations we've got, we've had for 40 years, and they're satellite measurements who are giving us a three-dimensional measurement of the atmosphere over the whole Earth. And that shows a different story. If we look at the proxies where you can actually calculate what the temperature was, and these proxies are based on many, many methods, looking at different forms of carbon and oxygen, uh, looking at... Um, sea levels, looking at um, tree rings, etc. we find that there are cycles. Hmm. And these cycles are really um, quite astounding. We have 400 million year cycles when we pull apart and stitch back to, together the planets. We've got cycles of about 140 million years when we have the wrong galactic address and we start to get very cold. Then we've got cycles when we're closer or further from the Sun and these are the Milankovitch orbital cycles every 100,000, 40,000 and 20,000 years. And then we have solar cycles which are 11 years, 22 years, 87 years, 210 years, 
1,500 years and 400 years and maybe 10,000 years. And then we have um, oceanic cycles, and we've known this from Chinese calendars, which are on a 60-year cycle, the same as the oceanic cycle. Then we've got lunar tidal cycles, every four and a half years and every, um, um, I think it's 13 and a half years, um, memory block, uh, where we push warm water up into the Arctic. So all you've got to do is look at history and find out when the Northwest Passage was open, and Mm. you can see it's cyclical. So all past climates, except for one or two asteroid events and big volcanoes, but all past climates have had these cycles, we can measure these cycles. Mm, mm. And so if you say it's the hottest year that we've had since measurements are kept, I have to say, well, um, what about since the time of Jesus? It's cooled. What about the time since the Vikings? It's warmed. What about since medieval times? Mm, mm, It's cooled. mm. What about since the Middle Ages? It's warmed. So look at it in perspective. Look at the cycles. Look at what's happening over time. So we're going to spend trillions of dollars to fix a problem that uh, either is terribly small or doesn't even exist. You've hit on something that's really, really important. In some communication with one of the world's leading climate scientists, he's just put out another book on climate science and he's asked me to read it and how it'll change my ways and, you know... Not Tim Flannery. No, 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 this (laughs) is a fellow in England, a fellow called Colin Summerhays. And Dr Summerhays is one of the leading experts in climate. And I said, well, Colin, this is fine. Um, Can you please give me half a dozen scientific papers showing me that human emissions drive climate change? Now, I've asked him that question now six times <sighs> and he replies every time and he gives me a few papers. He throws, uh, <laughs> he feeds the chooks with a bit of this <laughs> and that. And I actually read these scientific papers because I've been doing a huge amount of travel lately. I've been mid-air, so I've been able to read these on 12 and a half hour sectors and um, he has not been able to give me one single scientific paper that demonstrates that human emissions drive climate change. Mm -hmm. So what we've got is a whole empire of making money from solar, from wind, from hydrogen, and it's based on uh, uh, nothing. It sits there out Mm. out in the wilderness on nothing. So I'll write that up for a little story soon. I've got a few more little emails to to send to him, but basically I've demonstrated to him but there was no evidence. Yeah, a, de- a wonderful demonstration I heard was that uh, uh, carbon dioxide, if this is the big problem that we are trying to confront and fix, carbon dioxide is 0.04% of the atmosphere. Man's contribution to it is 3%. Australia's contribution to that 3% is 1%. So you're looking at 1% of 3% of 0.04%, which it depends on where you want to put the decimal point, I suppose. This is the thing we are turning this country upside down for nothing. Well, absolutely for nothing. We're destroying our economy based on a premise that doesn't exist yeah. and we're based amazing, on the fact it? that um, our carbon dioxide emissions are three parts of nine uh, fourths of bugger all. Yeah. Now... What we also don't hear much about is that 95% of the global emissions of plant food are from the Northern Hemisphere. They're not in the Southern Hemisphere at all. So um, the hemispheres are almost totally disconnected in the way the air circulates and we know that from spying on people (laughs) processing nuclear waste. It gives out a gas called Krypton-86. You can measure this. And the Krypton-86 doesn't move from hemisphere to hemisphere. Therefore, carbon dioxide wouldn't. So... um, Firstly, carbon dioxide has absolutely no effect at all. We know that from science. The second thing is that our contribution in this country is nothing. The third thing is that no-one's ever demonstrated that carbon dioxide drives global warming. And the, and the fourth thing is that carbon dioxide is plant food. We couldn't live without it. We couldn't. And we have had an increase in carbon dioxide over the last um, 100 years or so, the origin of that could be from warming up since the Maunder Minimum 300 years ago. The origin of that could be from warming up since medieval times. The or origin of could be human activity. Um, but whatever it is, we have seen a greening of the planet. Our satellite information is showing that North Africa and the Middle East has greened up a bit. Our crop yields have got a lot better. Now, that's 
partly due to carbon dioxide, but partly due to better agriculture and fertilisers. But what is happening is that we are denying the planet plant food. Now, many of those people who uh, are making a lot of noise about carbon dioxide are vegetarian or vegan. Well, they'd be the first to go if we stop carbon <laughs> dioxide. They breathe out carbon dioxide. They breathe in 0.04% yeah, yeah, yeah. and they breathe out 4%. Yeah. So not only is it hypocrisy, it's absolute crash stupidity. Yeah. And this has got nothing to do with carbon dioxide. This is a takeover of the energy systems, which is basically our national security. This is control of people um, by the unelected and this is those who hate industry who are trying to bring it down. And want revolution. The they want revolution. Yes. Professor, it's wonderful to see you, and I really do thank you for your sanity. I wish you were running, I don't know, the uh, Climate Council or whatever. I would never get appointed <laughs> to anything like that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But, you know, you, 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 you understand and you can uh, uh, explain it uh, I have knowledge, it. and that's you terribly have dangerous. Knowledge. Terribly, terribly dangerous. dangerous. Yes. I think I better get a guard to take you home. <laughs> I really do. Now, thank you. Bless your heart. Thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you for here. having me. The great Professor Plymar. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.